when change comes quickly. Among brown bears, family separation can be a sudden affair. Without warning, young bears can find themselves alone on the landscape. They must navigate their newfound freedom without mother's leadership. They gotta establish a home range and hone their fishing skills as they learn to survive. These subadult years are a time of exploration, learning, and challenge that accompany a, a period of awkward or sign adolescence. Hi everyone, this is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. And welcome to this live chat about teenage brown bears brought to you by Katmai National Park, the Katmai Conservancy and explore.org. Uh, joining me is my co-host, Felicia Jimenez, park ranger at Brooks Camp in Katmai National Park. Felicia, how are you today? I'm doing well. Um, thank you for having me. We're overlooking the south platform right now. We're, I'm at the south platform of the Brooks River. Um, and I don't know if you all can see behind me, but there are a ton of bears um, in the river right now. It's going to be really fun to see. <laughs> And that's a bit unusual for uh, the beginning of August, at least historically speaking. You don't often see a lot of bears foraging in that area at this time of the year, but that's great that you have that, that perspective on the river right now to, to help keep track of what, what is going on there. Uh, and if you have questions for us at home about the teenage life of brown bears or brown bears in general, you can drop those into the comments. A helpful moderator, Courtney from Explode.org, will be sending those in our direction. We have some queued up that were submitted in advance, but we'll also be looking to take live audience questions as well. Uh, Felicia, adolescence is a, is a universal experience in mammals. Uh, and for some species, it's a pretty quick transition into adulthood. But for others, such as humans and bears, it's a, a prolonged experience. It's full of growing pains and learning curves. Maybe we should begin our conversation about subadult bears by defining subadult bears. Uh, who are they, and and what are they? <laughs> yeah, well, the basic definition for a subadult this is the life stage of bears um, after they've separated from their mothers around two and a half to maybe about five and a half years of age before they reach sexual maturity. So this is their first time as independents, and you know if you want to connect that to the human experience. Um, it's, you know, essentially the teenage years of being a bear. It can be a pretty awkward stage in their life. Um, yeah, there's a lot of learning curves. There's a lot of growing pains that you have to go through. Um, but this is the subadult stage. It's a period of learning. Um, and when we're looking for subadults, there are some physical characteristics that we can look for. Um, so what are we looking at when we identify a subadult on the river? Um, Subadults, this is their first time um, independent away from their mother, so after they're a cub. Um, so they are smaller in body size, and they're going to have some awkward proportions. Um, you know, this is also this is that teenage stage, so they're going through growth spurts. Um, they might have kind of lanky looking limbs. Um, maybe their heads are a little bit too big for their body right now, so they have kind of a bobblehead, uh, you know, image and they have pretty big ears because they haven't grown quite into their ears yet um, but compared to cubs and adults sub adults are bigger than cubs um, but it depends and they can you know be small compared to a fully grown adult but they're still pretty big um, they're around two to three hundred pounds by the end um, of a season so, you know, for bears, um, they're in that in-between stage, and sometimes it can be a little difficult IDing from physical characteristics alone. It can be a bit of a hit or miss, um, especially on bears that are at the cusp of a life stage. So sub-adults that had just, um, you know, they were just a cub, they're about two and a half to they're rounding into their mature adult years. Um, but we can also look at behavior to identify a subadult. And subadults are fun to watch. They exhibit a lot of unique and just fun behavior to see. Um, they're navigating their world independently for the first time. They tend to be more playful. They make mistakes because they're learning. And um, as they gain more confidence in you know, their movements, they're also willing to push boundaries. Um, Mike, can you tell us what life looks like when a bear is on their own for the first time? It, I think it can become 
are, are come as quite of a, a surprise to them uh, in, mm -hmm. in a sense. Brown bears everywhere and all, brown bears of all ages exist within a hierarchy with the largest, most assertive bears at the top and the smallest bears typically at the bottom. Uh, from that standpoint alone, you'd think that logically cubs would be low ranking. However, families with older cubs, such as uh, families with yearlings and two and a half year olds, they experience a, a relatively high rank, like uh, Grazer and her kids last year, who you're seeing this footage from uh, on top of the waterfall. So picture yourself as an older cub. Maybe if you're looking for an example this year, think of yourself as um, 909 Junior. That's the two and a half year old adopted by her aunt, uh, number 910. Mother bears with older cubs are like a small gang of bears. When they move in tandem, they can intimidate many other bears, especially younger independent bears and sometimes even young adults. So there's a lot of advantage to sticking with mom. Then imagine uh, maybe, uh, you know, Grazer's Girls this year. Uh, your advantage in position in the hierarchy collapses because uh, mother experienced ex estrus earlier in the year and that forced a separation in a family breakup. Um, and that begins your life of independence. And while some adult bears, um, you can often see them hovering on the fringes of the falls. They're, you know, they experience more freedom of choice. And that's something that we all, I think, crave uh, deep down. Some adults are also the smallest bodied independent bears. Therefore, they experience a sudden and drastic change in their position of the hierarchy. Other bears are no longer intimidated by them because they don't have a bodyguard. They don't have that maternal bodyguard along with them. And they are immediately shoved to the bottom of the hierarchy. And sometimes uh, quite literally uh, when they are trying to vie for fishing spots with larger bears mm -hmm. at the fall. The ch this change is sudden. It, it creates new challenges for the young bears that they might not have prior experience with, especially if the bear was a cub with no siblings who did not experience competition for food within the litter. Uh, Felicia, subadults must adapt to these new circumstances quickly. It's a, a time full of challenge and exploration for them. Mm -hmm. We find that subadults aren't always uh, loners in this process of, of, uh, of maturation. Yeah, we definitely see that. Um, some adults, you know, pretty quickly on learn that there's powers in numbers. Um, sorry, I'm fighting with the plane. <laughs> um, yeah, some adults pretty quickly on learn that there's powers in numbers. Um, you know, you're back at the bottom of the hierarchy. Um, you're smaller than adult bears. So if you are, you know, utilize your social skills in this time, sometimes some adults get together with unrelated subadults and kind of form little subadult gangs. Um, and, you know, numbers give them an advantage. They have others that, um, you know, they can play with, as you're seeing here. Um, they have others that they can, you know, explore with. And it gives them kind of backup in, you know, a world where they're back at the bottom. Um, so, Hanging together and hanging around with others in your age group definitely puts them at an advantage. And if you just happen to be part of a litter and have siblings, um, that's a built-in buddy for you. And siblings often hang around each other. Um, in this photo that you're seeing, this is 128. Um, not numbered yet. Um, they'll get a number at the end of the season. But, uh, you know, three and a half year olds, they have been seen both together in this picture at the beginning of the season and also separately. And it helps to have a sibling to lean on in this position. Um, you can navigate the world together you have extra backup and protection when exploring um, and yeah siblings definitely do stick together especially in the beginning as they get older though um, they do you know maybe go their separate ways they are going to become independent bears but having a sibling at least for the beginning part of it definitely puts them in an advantage um, so it's you know really good just to have a buddy that you can explore and also play with um so mike maybe you want to tell us about how some adults play with each other yeah compared to other age classes sub adult bears are among the most playful they'll use things <laughs> like pieces of driftwood or really any novel object they find as toys plus um as you mentioned felicia they'll, they'll hang out with each other and engage in, in frequent play fights and wrestling matches. Um, among subadult bears, play is often initiated by a bear approaching another bear with its head held high. A playful bear will sometimes sway its head 
back and forth. I think that's a signal to another bear that this is a friendly encounter. And it seems to be akin to the play bow used by dogs. It's sort of like, hey, I'm friendly, um, let's have fun. Uh, they also sniff each other's muzzles, sort of like a handshake that seals the deal. And play is clearly important to young bears. Uh, but science uh, has yet to fully explain this behavior from the standpoint of survival and ultimately, uh, you know, future reproductive fitness. Uh, my, you know, just um, regular dictionary defines play sort of in a limiting way. It says play is an activity for enjoyment and recreation rather than for serious or practical purpose. This makes uh, play sound uh, superfluous. It may appear purposeless. But play is widespread, widespread among different types of animals, including birds, fish, mammals, even some reptiles and some invertebrates. One scientific review that I read about play in mammals defined it as a motor activity that appears purposeless. And I think that's getting closer to the truth because appearing purposeless doesn't mean it is purposeless. This allows room for us to explore the possible benefits of play in animals rather than dismiss it as something that's extraneous. Uh, in bears, play might be a training exercise for the unexpected. It helps build the motor and mental skills needed to, to cope with the sudden loss of control. It helps young bears learn to communicate with sparring partners. There are possible exercise and strength building benefits. Play may also have implications for dominance and survival in the future, although we don't know how the friendly relationships forged among young bears influence their future interactions. We still need more study of that. And finally, play, I think, must be fun. We see those benefits in play in human children. Uh, the motivation in the moment isn't necessarily to build teamwork or communication skills or whatever, but just to have fun. I suspect that's the same for bears. And watching subadults allows us to consider play as a motivator, something that may bring survival benefits as well as, um, you know, showcasing that they have the ability to have fun with other bears and also um, alone when they just find a toy on the landscape. And Felicia, it seems reasonable to me that play can help bears learn and cope with new situations. And in so many ways, subadulthood is a new experience uh, when the ability to, to learn, especially, is among uh, their greatest assets. Oh, yeah, this is a period of learning for bears. And bears are going to learn through all kinds of ways, including play. Play is a really major way and bears learn you know, and bears learning. Um, so at this stage of life, you know, everything that they have learned so far has been from mom. Mom sets them up um, to be independent. And then once they are on their own, it is a steep learning curve for bears at this stage of life. Um, they're going to learn from all kinds of sources, from play, um, through social interactions, like Mike was saying. Um, they're going to learn from watching other adults. Um, and they're also going to learn from trial and error. Um, this bear that we're seeing right here is bear 225, and we're seeing her figure out um, a new fishing method. So they're going to use this time to figure out fishing methods. So we see here, um, she's snorkeling right now. This is one of the fishing methods. Um, bears will keep their ears above the water um, so that they can still hear what's going on and then put their muzzle in um, so that they can see the fish but still hear what's going on. Um, and this is just one of the techniques. There are some other techniques that bears use um, to fish, um, especially for sub-adults when you're at the bottom of that hierarchy. You don't necessarily have the best access to prime fishing spots. So we'll see sub-adults, you know, participate in fishing strategies like running in and grabbing scraps or begging from adults. Um, but they have to learn and use this time to figure out their place on the river um, and navigate and all these difficult social dynamics. And they're going to make a lot of mistakes um, as they learn, as is a mark of adolescence. But, you know, in this period of trial and error and learning, they can also innovate. Um, one of the bears that, you know, is a prime example of this was 164. Um, this bear, as you can see here, when he was a sub-adult, has innovated this new technique of sitting under the falls like this in the plunge pool, um, hopefully catching, you know, fish as they don't make it and then maybe make it into his mouth. Um, that's innovative. That's something that we haven't really seen from bears before. And sub-adulthood is the perfect period um, for bears to figure out these new techniques. Um, and, you know, 
it's also just really fun to watch them innovate like this. Um, and so bears are learning, you know, how they're going to navigate the river, how they're going to learn how to fish. Um, and this kind of brings us to an audience question um, that we've gotten before from Terry. Um, this question says, regarding the young subs around 335's age, they grew up during years of plenty. How will they develop the skills to survive the lean years? Will it be more trial and error or watching adult bears? Um, I love seeing 335. Um, and she's a bear that we see quite a bit. Uh, she is definitely a curious bear and bears are you know smart and resilient um we've been really fortunate to see you know strong salmon runs and this year the run was a little bit late um and this is another part in you know their journey um 335 is a good example because she has grown up during all these years where we've had record breaking uh salmon years but now she is an independent sub adult trying to navigate that on her own um without mom 435 to help her so this period is going to be a really good um way for her to figure out how to provide for herself when the food source isn't secure and she's going to learn valuable lessons from this year um but this is what sub adult phase is uh she's someone who you know has grown up around you know the lower river area and this is time where they're going to try the places that they've grown up fishing um but sub adults also during this period might expand their grounds and try new streams um, that might maybe have more fish during leaner years. Um, generally, Brooks River bears, you know, return to the river um, after they become independent, but not always. Um, they might try a new home range. There are a lot of other streams and tributaries um, throughout the river and also in the knack uh, you know, watershed. So they might move and, um, you know, disperse a little bit and explore a new possibility of a home range, which, um, Mike, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about some adults and how they explore. Yeah, it's, it's an extraordinarily important part of their experience mm -hmm. during those first few years of independence. And somebody did ask, um, one of our, our live audience members right now asked a question related to this, uh, that is, what is one of the most important things a teenage bear needs to learn? And I think uh, there's there's many different things, but um, you know, kind of along the lines of what we were just just discussing, it is maintaining maybe not learning this, but just at least maintaining the ability to stay flexible and to learn. I mean, they're rapidly growing; their brains are still developing. So much like you know, young people, they are a sponge for different information. They're very flexible in their behaviors and can adapt and cope to new circumstances. So I think that's, you know, maintaining that ability mm -hmm. to learn as they explore the landscape is one of the most important things that they can do. And as we've uh, discussed um, with, with bears, those subadult years are a time of, of learning and change. In particular, subadult bears are posed with the special challenge mm -hmm. of establishing a home range. And unlike mm -hmm. wolves, bears are not territorial so they don't defend areas of a landscape from intruders instead bears have overlapping home ranges and that's you know just what we see at brooks river the, all of the bears at brooks river have this um, brooks river as part of their home range but they're not defending brooks river from other bears they're not trying to keep them away they're just sort of interacting on the landscape uh, to each individual's um, sensibilities and tolerances mm -hmm. So over, over time though, establishing home range is a risky um, event and it can bring bears into conflict with other bears and even people over space and food resources. Given the abundance of food at Brooks River, it's, it's not surprising that many young bears return to the river after family breakup. Using at least part of their mother's home range brings familiarity. It brings a reasonable idea of where and when they can find food and what the hazards of the habitats might be also who the competitors are. But dispersal away from your mother's home range can bring uh, young bears opportunities that they may not find living near mom. This could be an explanation for the disappearance of subadult bears from Brooks River. They're, mm -hmm. they're finding a new home. Uh, and whether a bear shares part of its home range with its mother is greatly influenced by its sex. Young males tend to disperse beyond their mother's home range while females tend to stay closer to home. In fact, a study on the central Alaska Peninsula in the 1970s found that subadult males dispersed on average a distance of 30 miles away from their mother's home range, 
Um, and that was about twice the distance of females in the same area. Uh, this pattern, uh, especially regarding the tendency of males to disperse farther uh, and have larger home ranges than females, it really has far reaching implications and consequences for the genetic diversity of bears, which is, I think, one of the really neat aspects of, of subadult life. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at how their dispersal affects um, the, the DNA and the genetics and the genetic diversity of brown bear populations really worldwide. Because when you look at different types of DNA carried by male and female brown bears, scientists have found varied histories of dispersal and establishment of different bear populations. And we'll take a look at North America just as an example. Mitochondrial DNA, for example, is only passed through the female line because sperm don't carry mitochondrion and they don't alter the mitochondrion contained in the mother's, mother's egg upon fertilization. So I have my mother's and my maternal grandmother's and my maternal great grandmother's and so forth. I have their mm -hmm. mitochondrial DNA in me, but I can't pass that on to any offspring. Um, and that's the same in, in brown bears. Uh, brown and grizzly bears, they're the same species. And grizzly bears have long been described as a separate subspecies of brown bear. But analysis of mitochondrial DNA shows no substantial genetic divide between the so-called grizzly bears that live in interior portions of North America and brown bears that live along coastal areas. So this image that I made from Google, Google Earth uh, outlines basically like three um, bear clades, uh, brown bear clades in North America. The area sort of like the, towards the Northwest, uh, uh, including Alaska, parts of like the Yukon um, and Northwest territories with the, I mean, also over into Siberia uh, and Kamchatka, the areas, that area with the, the vertical stripes, that's one clade. So that's one area of, of bears that was established um, through um, a genetic ancestors or genetic, closely related genetic ancestors. There's another group um, that's represented by that red dot on the mm -hmm. Alexander Archipelago in Southeast Alaska. So they have a unique set of mitochondrial DNA. And then the, the last clade is the group that's um, marked by the area uh, with horizontal lines. And that's basically like mm -hmm. um, Southwest uh, Canada, and Western, the Western United States. And of course, that's only the, the current range of, of brown bears in North America. Um, I don't really know if anyone's looked closely at you know, the DNA from, from bears in extinct populations like in California or something like that. Uh, but, it, but since female bears tend to establish home ranges near their mothers, their DNA is really this differentiation between these different groups of bears in North America. Uh, so I think that's quite fascinating that we're seeing how, you know, females, since they're kind of home bodies, they help to differentiate the, the genetics. However, DNA carried through the Y chromosome can only be passed from father to son. And the story of that DNA is one of widespread dispersal uh, between different areas of North America and even beyond. So when you look at the Y chromosome DNA that's passed from father to son, there really isn't that differentiation between the different bear clades like you see in um, uh, among the mitochondrial DNA. So I tend to think of the subadult years as stories of individual bears, like we talked about, um, you know, 224, 225, 335, we're gonna we'll talk about some others in just a little bit. And, and certainly that's true. I mean, it is stories of individuals, but on another level, the dispersal and exploration of young bears has far reaching implications for the genetic diversity of brown bears. And Felicia, this is all part of a, a large story of chance and risk and learning as mm -hmm. young bears grow into adulthood. So thank you for, um, for bearing with me as I, I rambled uh, through that. But I think it was such a, 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 it's such a fascinating aspect of, of, of subadult life to explore and to consider. Uh, but, you know, we, we have to think about the individuals um, in, these, uh, in these stories as well. How are mm -hmm. some of the newly separated bears coping this year? I know a lot of people are wondering about uh, Grazer's most recent offspring mm -hmm. who are now independent young bears. Oh yeah, there are a couple of bears that um, we're looking at to see those storylines develop. Um, but you got to put yourself in the place of a subadult at this time. Um, you know, when you're with mom as a cub, life is good. Um, you are at, especially if mom is like at the top of the hierarchy. Mom gives you protection. Mom provides you food. Mom gives you, you know, her status. Um, especially if she's at the top. And then all of a sudden, overnight almost, um, they go straight down to the bottom of the hierarchy, which is 
you know, why you see sub-adult bears willing to push boundaries a little bit because they're trying to, you know, figure out their um, space and their place in the hierarchy. Um, and, you know, as a ranger, I walk, you know, these trails all the time and walking home um, and you can recognize sub-adults. Um, and maybe sometimes I'll see a sub-adult um, and they are, uh, they're curious um, and maybe, you know, see them walking and they might want to go off a little too close. So you step off the trail and let them pass. Um, and they're just, they're curious. Um, and one of those curious bears, oh, I'm so sorry if I'm fighting with a plane. <laughs> um, one of those curious bears that, you know, we have been seeing quite a bit is 335. Um, here's a photo of her swimming in the river. Um, I love seeing this bear a lot. Her mom is bear 435 Holly. Um, and she is, you know, she was brought into camp a lot growing up. So she is quite a curious bear. And, um, you know, sub-adults, they often come back to areas that are familiar. Um, so for 335, that's in camp. Um, but the difference is she's on her own right now. Um, so uh, since mom isn't there, it's not going to be the same experience for her versus when she was a cub. Um, mom isn't giving her that protection, that status in the hierarchy. So going to those familiar places isn't necessarily the same. She comes through camp quite a bit. She's pretty curious. It's fun to watch her move and navigate. Um, and, you know, you see her going and swimming through the river and having interactions with other bears that are not always the same um, since she's been on her own. Um, and then another group or another couple of sub-adults that we're looking at, um, we actually just got an audience question from Gina about 128's kids. Um, and this question is, do you think Grazer will ever tolerate her daughters on the lip of the falls, or is she just chasing her away the first season of separation? Um, so this is an example of going back to the same familiar places, like 128s to three and a half year olds. Um, they've grown up going to the falls with mom. Um, and so you see in this video, this is the bear on the left is one of 128s, and she's going back to the falls. Um, as she always has, but it's going to be a different experience for her um, without mom's protection. 128 is, you know, a dominant bear at the place of the hierarchy and um, she gets chased away um, in that, you know, um, in that video, in that clip. Uh, so 128's kids, you know, benefited from mom being at the top of the hierarchy and had access to those prime fishing spots. So you can see her now. Um, here's 128 coming, and she's saying, you know, get out of that spot. Um, and, you know, so the question asks, do we think that she's just chasing her away to reinforce that separation? Um, and, you know, her daughter right now is at the bottom of the hierarchy as a sub-adult. And I do think it's, I think it's both. Um, as you see, you know, 128 sub-adult gets pushed down. Um, and I think it's both. I think she is, you know, reinforcing that separation. Um, mom says, you know, move. That's my spot. Get your own. Um, but also her kids are sub-adults. Um, so... I think maybe eventually she'll tolerate, um, you know, her daughters. But right now, especially in that clip, we're seeing behavior of, you know, a dominant bear forcing a less dominant bear out of the way. And those dynamics um, that we see are something that sub-adults are learning right now. They're learning their spot in the hierarchy. And, um you know, you're, that's mom, but mom is also more dominant than you in this hierarchy right now. So that's going to be a social dynamic that they're going to have to learn from. Um, so, you know, as they learn, as they navigate sub-adulthood, um, they'll eventually find their place and gain that confidence um, in their movement. And it's a really interesting and fun, you know, stage in a bear's life to watch. Um, they're going through this awkward teenage phase and you want to root for them and you want to see them learn. Um, and a bear's behavior is going to change pretty greatly from when you're seeing them in those awkward teenage years. Um, they're going to go from maybe a gawky sub-adult bear to eventually having the confidence of a mature adult bear. Um, and some of those behaviors and some of those changes are just really fun to witness. And we have some great examples of bears like this. Mike, if, um, can you maybe share a little bit more of some bears that embody this? 
Well, right now, I think one of the younger adults that uh, we had watched as a sub adult mm -hmm. that's, you know, kind of coming into his own now, he's growing into a very large bodied bear. We've seen him on the lip of the mm -hmm. falls a lot this year. He's not easy to displace from that location because he's he's growing quite large is, is number 821. Uh, he was somewhat playful as a younger bear. He's hard to push around now. Uh, his example shows a process of like maturation uh, that continued into young adulthood. So like a lot of those those behaviors that we we say sort of define the subadult years, those carry over into young adult years, such as things like playfulness, maybe tolerance for other bears, uh, exploration and learning. Uh, and I remember experiencing that too. Uh, you know, I, while I was legally considered an adult in the United States at age 18, I really had no idea what I was doing most of the time. And some will argue that I still don't. Um, and that's a hint to if anyone younger, um, you know, in their teenage years or younger is watching right now, that know that adults often don't know what they're doing. So when they say they, they do, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, so A21, again, one of those bears that we can see sort of like transitioning from the subadult years recently into adulthood. And uh, Felicia, I think 151 was another bear that um, showed that that example as well. He's not a, a young bear anymore, hasn't been for several years, mm -hmm. but he is a bear that we saw sort of uh, come of age on, on bear camp. Yeah, um, so 151 is a great bear to show, you know, the difference between sub-adults and adulthood. Um, 151 is, he looks so cute in this photo, you would not recognize this bear. Um, he was ID'd in 2009 as a sub-adult, so this is young 151. Um, and like many other sub-adults, um, 151 liked to play. Um, and a lot of people, you know, on the cams, we were able to see him often get pushed out by other bigger bears, um, you know, later on. Um, and all of that play fighting, um, interactions with other sub-adults, paid off um, because you get those learning skills to practice and that remember that really cute photo of 151 um here here he is um but this is a completely different version of 151 than we would see now um 151 now um is i would not call him playful um or as cute um he is one of the largest, more dominant males on Brooks River. Um, and there is a photo maybe, um, but he, what's it called? He is one of the larger, more dominant males um, on Brooks River. Um, and as a larger, more dominant male, um, he has injuries that we can see on him. Um, and, you know, that play fighting really pays off because they learn those skills that they will use later on in their adult life um, to build up those fighting skills, which is what's going to be super helpful when, you know, bears like 151 are becoming large and going to the top of the hierarchy. And it takes, it takes a while. Um, in the sub-adult stage, you know, they're at the bottom, but as bears get into adulthood, they'll find their way, they'll make their place. Um, and it's really cool to see those behavioral shifts and all those lessons that they learn as the sub-adult pay off into adulthood. Um, yeah. Uh, is there anything else you want to add, Mike? Well, yeah, 151, he was one of those bears that I don't think you could have predicted that he would balloon into such a such a large bear. <laughs> uh, like, I mean, he is a light bulb in the fall, and I'm looking forward to seeing how fat he gets uh, this year. So this is him last year. Yeah, it's, when you see these young bears that are small and scraggly, it's it's hard to predict how big they can actually get. But we that's one of the really amazing things about watching bear cam across years is we see this transition from the teenage years into full maturity. Uh, and I think that's wonderful that we can experience that and share that with everybody around the world. It's a really kind of unique wildlife watching experience associated um, with, with brown bears. Uh, but Felicia, I know that, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, um, sub-adults so far and, you know, the challenges mm -hmm. that they face, the learning that they undergo, but our audience is still curious for more. We have a lot of questions that have, so maybe you will want to spend uh, the next few minutes trying to answer those at least if you're mm -hmm. up for it. Yeah, definitely. All right, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I know, you know, the, the topic of salmon and, you know, maybe the lack thereof uh, at different times of the summer earlier, especially earlier in, in July, um, in 
June. That has been a topic of conversation for a lot of people over the years or over this summer. Uh, so somebody was wondering, does the abundance or lack of salmon affect the time of family breakup for next year? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. It seems like um, that is going to be kind of set to, um, and, and it always seems to come about uh, in late spring. That's like the peak of the bear's mating season. So that's when most family breakups happen to occur. And it, uh, I think Felicia, uh, it's kind of an unconscious decision um, that mom's body determines whether she's going to go back into estrus or not. Mm -hmm. And that's often the catalyst for family breakup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... If I feel like if we were to see an effect, um, I think it's just going to be a difference on potentially maybe sows arriving with new cubs. So that's going to be a different thing than family separation. Um, I think those sows are still going to separate from their, you know, new sub adults, um, no matter what, um, as long as, you know, their bodies go into that cycle of estrus, um, which is triggered by something different. And mother bears in Katmai typically keep their cubs for two to three summers. They'll go to the mm -hmm. den with them one more time, spend an additional winter with them, and then separate the following spring. Uh, there's, again, there's variation in the um, in the dura the total duration of maternal care among brown bears. Maybe that has something to do with food resources. Maybe mm -hmm. it doesn't, but there's there's quite a bit of variation of like how long in total brown bears will keep their cubs, generally two to three summers at least. But the timing uh, of family breakup, that I think is is pretty much um, fixed. Uh, we, we mentioned, uh, or at least I remember mentioning during the live chat, Felicia, about um, 909 Junior, who's a two and a half year old. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that bear has a kind of unique story um, because it was uh, she was adopted by her aunt, number 910 this year. Somebody was wondering, uh, is the BD family considered teenagers yet? And I think maybe in reference to um, number 909 and junior. And they get those nicknames because their um, their grandmother is number 409 Bead Nose. So we don't see Bead Nose anymore along Brooks River. But 909 um, junior is still around. Um, but uh, she's not, I don't think we would technically consider her to be a sub adult Felicia because she's not a truly independent bear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think she's just considered an older cub um, right now. I mean, while technically sub adults are, you know, hit that two and a half year old stage, she's not independent yet. Um, I wouldn't consider her or 910 Junior sub adults until that family breakup of the 910 family has happened. And that could be next year. Maybe it won't be. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's to be determined because we haven't seen number 910 separate from her cubs before. This is her first litter. Um, so she could keep her biological offspring for an additional year as a two and a half year old next mm -hmm. summer. Uh, so maybe that opens up the possibility of 909 Junior staying with that family as a three and a half year old. That would be kind of wild to see. I've only seen a three and a half year old bear <laughs> carry her mother once at Brooks River before. And they're, they're giant. They're just, again, this big gang of bears that can basically do whatever they want along the river. So it's really interesting to see. Uh, uh, a question She's that came now. in pretty early, <laughs> right? Yeah, she is. She is really big. Uh, sorry, to, I didn't mean to mean to step on you, but yeah, she is really big. So yeah, um, enjoy that experience of watching them while we can. Hmm. Uh, a question that came in pretty early uh, during our um, our program today had to, has to do with um, you know when bears know if they've passed into adulthood. So uh, this person writes in: How do bears know they have passed into adulthood when they start breeding? what triggers breeding so felicia maybe you could um reiterate one more time like what is the difference between a sub-adult bear and an adult bear yeah yeah so sub-adult bears um you know that's between two and a half to five and a half years old before they become sexually mature um but sub-adults um they you know we do see courtship happen a little bit during that stage but it's kind of more like practice um they're not sexually mature they that would you know they're not ready to have cubs yet um it doesn't mean practice doesn't happen um but once they reach adulthood is when they are sexually mature so when you know a female can go into estrus and then that you know those hormones are 
cycle um, and trigger, you know, that phase. Um, and then actual mating season and courtship and then, um, you know, a, a pregnancy can be conceived and sustained. Um, and then that next year, that female will come back with cubs. So that's when they're considered adults. Um, but yeah, it's typically after five and a half years of age is when they are considered adults. Like in people too, there's no set, you know, really set age. I mean, you can't say magically that all mm -hmm. there, or we don't, we don't say magically that all five and a half year olds um, bears are, are adults. Mm -hmm. There's quite a bit of variation in there. Sometimes we, we've seen bears come back a little bit younger with cubs for the first time. So yeah, it's, it's just kind of mm -hmm. like in people, it, there's a, there's a, quite a bit of variation in there. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a question, I'm going to try to remember some stats off the top of my head, Felicia. Uh, um, I'm not sure if you, can remember uh, or, or know mm -hmm. more specifically than I do. Uh, somebody was wondering about the survival rate for subadults compared to bears of other ages. We know that cubs, first year cubs especially, mm -hmm. have uh, have um, fairly high mortality rates um, in the, in that first year. Mm -hmm. It can vary among populations. If a, if a first year cub makes it to this point in the year, so August, they have a really great chance of surviving for the rest of the year. Uh, but that early part mm -hmm. of the year when they first come out of the game is when they have the highest mortality. But then as um, as bears age and mature, their survival rate tends to go up and up and up. I think something around like 70% mm -hmm. of uh, or more of like yearlings will survive. Um, and I think it's even mm -hmm. higher for sub adults and adult bears. Adult bears is maybe like 90%, but I can't, unfortunately, I don't have those statistics written down right in front of me. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you can um, elaborate more. Yeah. I don't have the hard number, but typically, um, yeah, just what you've said, the older a bear gets, they're most likely going to survive into adulthood. And for sub-adults, they're pretty much almost there. So, I mean, once that reach, they, once they reach that stage, um, it's most likely they're going to, you know, have a high survival rate into adulthood. Sub-adults also learn, uh, like we talked about, they learn a lot. Uh, from new experiences, doing things on their own for the first time. So somebody was wondering about digging dens. Uh, this person writes in, I can imagine a, a 2.5 year old subadult foraging okay, but finding a den site and digging it seems very challenging. Is this a known cause of mortality? So I think something like den failure. Uh, not really that I know of, but Felicia, it, it's interesting to consider um, that, that bears have an instinct to dig dens and find good denning habitat, even if they haven't been taught that. But I think there's also quite a bit of, of things that they remember from that experience by being with mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wish we had more information on, you know, behavior and denning behavior um, for bears, but we just don't have that um, right now. Um, but, you know, I would assume that they learn so much from mom and maybe you know their first den independently isn't the best den ever um i guess you can you know equate that to a human experience when you get your first apartment for the first time ever it's not gonna be the best place um but it's gonna get you through it and they're gonna you know retain those lessons they've learned from mom um and they have that strong instinct to dig um so yeah i think they're gonna they're gonna be fine The behavior of, of subadults varies a lot too. We talked about that earlier. Um, somebody was wondering though about what they're maybe more likely to do. Are, are teenage bears likely to defend themselves when threatened or more likely to uh, retreat? What's been maybe your experience, Felicia, uh, interacting on the ground with subadult bears? Um, from my experience, it seems like the majority of the time they're more likely to retreat um, just because they're smaller, they're at a disadvantage. Um, and, you know, maybe they're a little bit more willing to push boundaries of bigger adult bears that are in the way. But once that adult bear sticks up for themselves, they're getting pushed out. Um, they know they're at the bottom. Um, some bears will, you know, stand their ground. I think it varies individual um, to individual. Um, but in that sub adult phase, when they're at most willing to push the boundaries it's going to come from probably bears that are smaller than them or like maybe a ranger is walking home and they're like hmm, maybe you're interesting to follow for a little bit um but yeah i mean they know their place at the bottom of the hierarchy so i think they're going to be more likely to retreat a little bit 
that's that's been my experience too. Once they, um, once whatever they are curious about sort of like stands up yeah. to, to them and says that's enough. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's all you need to actually say to a bear. Hey, that's enough. Um, you know, scruff your feet out of it or whatever, and then it's like, okay, well, I don't want to deal with this. But if um, you know, they get, they're so curious. Um, if you end up like making a strange noise, like you try to avoid them, and you step on a, I remember stepping off the trail and breaking a branch accidentally, and then they're like, oh, ears forward, head up. They're like, hey, what's that? And they come into kind of looking in that mm -hmm. direction because they're so curious about that. But then once they realize that I'm not, you know, something to play with or uh, or engage with, then they'll kind of they'll they'll back away. There are definitely stories mm -hmm. of, of people at Brooks Camp uh, having subadults follow them for significant distances because it seems like the, the, the subadults um, want to see how far they can push those boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one of those characteristics that you'll sometimes see in them. And I can, I can also remember instances of watching them interact with like more dominant bears at Brooks Falls and they'll get like displaced from like a more dominant or by a more dominant bear and then the the uh, the big guy or the big girl will turn his or her back on that subadult, and then the subadult will sort of like hop charge the other bear from behind, mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, you're not so tough. And <laughs> clearly, the other bear doesn't <laughs> doesn't think that <laughs> that the, that subadult is a threat. But it's almost like out of frustration. It's like, how far can I push this? Um, it's like you know you know when it well when it when a teenager gets chastised by an adult or a teacher at school or something like that. They're, then they go, you know, around the corner and then start making faces or something like that. So I think sometimes those things happen as well. Uh, it, we, we did talk about um, home ranges and, you know, dispersal and things like that. There was a question about um, Kodiak bears though, and um, whether like the clades that I talked about Oh, do you, uh, before we get to that, Felicia, do you have there's a bear a, nearby? There's a bear. <laughs> He's, it's like standing up in the, or its little ears are up in the grass. Okay, I think it's gone now. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep yeah. looking behind you as, as best we can. Okay. Uh, hopefully it'll come a little bit closer to, you, to your side of the river. Uh, yeah, but so, you know, I, I talked about clade, subadult dispersal, and how that um, affects brown bear genetics and genetic diversity in North America. So somebody was wondering about Kodiak bears. Because uh, I talked about three clades in North America, somebody was uh, asked. Mm -hmm. So those three clades include Kodiak bears, which are considered a different subspecies. And yes, Kodiak bears are considered a separate subspecies. They are a unique population of bears. They have uh, differences in skull morphology. On average, they're the largest of North America's brown bears. Katmai bears are, are a close second, and you could throw bears like seven four seven over on. Kodiak Island and, and then everyone would be like, that's a Kodiak bear because he's so big. Uh, but um, yeah, Kodiak bears are included in that clade that includes ca um, Katmai bears and basically all bears in Alaska, except for that Alexander um, archipelago. Felicia, it's, all, it's really interesting to, to consider how uh, Kodiak bears have been isolated for or since the last um, glacial maximum about 12,000 years ago and how they have become sort of like um, an uber bear in a sense, um, like, like Katmai's bears, because they have such a, um, abundant food resources and they've been genetically isolated. So their subadults are, um, mm -hmm. don't have access to the mainland. They're doing, you know, something else out there. Mm -hmm. I, I love that part of um, genetics where we talk about really cool isolated subspecies um, due to geography, like the ecology between populations on islands are really cool um but yeah it's a pretty common question um those bears are not going to make it across the kodiak strait i mean not the kodiak the shellacoff strait um into katmai so they're going to be completely separate oh. and another question that came in about uh, we'll try to get to maybe just a couple of more before we conclude our broadcast today this one though is um back to the idea of hibernation and subadults um, somebody was wondering when winter comes and the um, subadults are no longer with mom, where do they hibernate? How do they know um, where to go? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Felicia? Um, uh, yeah, it comes down to those lessons that they learned with mom. Um, there might be a familiar area to them um, that they've gone before. Like, you know, it would be really great to know exactly where these, ben, uh, these bears' den. We don't 
have the exact knowledge. We know they like nice, steep, vegetated slopes. Um, Mike, you've written a blog on um, finding, you know, den sites on Dumpling Mountain. Um, but they're going to have to rely on those instincts that they have and also just those lessons um, from mom. But that instinct to den, dig a den, and hibernate is very strong with them. Um, so they're going to be fine. They're going to figure out a spot um, that's going to be good. They like areas on the side of a mountain with high snowpack. Um, so they're going to know how to look for those areas to den. And denning habitat, too, is not... Uh, in short supply in Katmai. Bears in mm -hmm. Katmai, they don't use like caves or like tree cavities. The geology doesn't doesn't like create caves in Katmai. And then uh, the trees don't don't really grow big enough for, for bears to utilize mm -hmm. those spaces as denning sites. So what they're doing is they're going to um, steep, well-vegetated slopes that collect and hold a, a lot of snow. So like Dumpling Mountain behind you, Felicia, is, is, has a mm -hmm. lot of great habitat for bears to make dens of the surrounding mountains. Uh, have that habitat as well. So even if a, I think a subadult bear is like, well, I'm not really sure where to go this year, they probably could just go up on any mountain and be like, yeah, this seems mm -hmm. <laughs> this seems good enough in that sense. Uh, Felicia, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll throw this question to you because um, maybe it's it's easier for you to see this since you have had more time along the river mm -hmm. this summer, basically um, than than me certainly and, and most most other people except for you know of course and maybe your other coworker rangers uh, somebody was wondering can you give an example of a bear click of teens this year i don't know if we've had a really great chance to see that on the cams there's been some subadult bears hanging out have you noticed any you know groups of subadult bears that seem to be you know spending a lot of time together or um or maybe they're associating with each other frequently I don't know if there are any that I recognize um, that I've seen stick together all the time. Um, there were actually today um, two bears that were about sub-adult age um, running around and playing on the beach um, that you can't see on the cameras, but it was, you know, I think around 2 p.m. today um, running and playing in the lake and in the water. Um, so I've seen those dynamics um, already. Uh, there were, I know there was a group of bears playing around on the spit earlier, maybe last week, like three sub-adults or three bears playing. Um, I don't know the number or the ID of those bears, but they have been running around. I've heard the stories of um, other, you know, rangers, and they see clicks of like four or five sub adults running around. Yeah, like these, these three are sticking around together and playing on the spit, um, and that's always fun to see. But I don't know if there are any, I like individual bears that I can ID but I've definitely seen it. Um, I haven't seen 128's kids together around either recently, but they were sticking together in the beginning of the season. But I think when I've seen them recently, they've just been individual um, and apart from each other. But they do form those cliques. Um, I just don't know the ID of the individual bears. Well, it's always fun to watch, I think, the young bears on mm -hmm. the bear cams. As we come to our conclusion of our, our chat, there's one more thing that I want to share about the, the world of subadults, because physically and behaviorally, subadult bears are analogous to human teenagers. I mean, we've been talking about that mm -hmm. throughout the broadcast today. And by thinking about this stage in a bear's life, we can compare subadulthood to our own. And this is a picture that I shared a few years ago. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> It's assault mic circa 1996. I was rocking a mullet, um, unconsciously uh, inspired by the hockey player Yarmir Yager. Uh, I certainly wasn't comfortable in my own skin. I remember this time as, as awkward. I was uncomfortable a lot. Um, and I was, you know, I was learning a ton and I was gaining independence trying to navigate my world. Uh, you know, and I'm still accused by people close to me, unjustly, I might add that you know, sometimes they'll say that I'm a little bit immature. Uh, we don't, I don't think ever completely grow out of our teenage years. I mean, people might say that they do, but I think we, we hold characteristics in common with our younger selves. Um, and, and bears are doing that as well. This is, um, you know, the subadult years is, a, and it's, those teenage years are a life stage that we share with bears. It's full of strife, it's full of change, challenge, growth, and exploration. 
Uh, and thanks for joining us today to learn about the, the life of teenage bears. And thanks to my co-host, uh, Katmai National Park Ranger, Felicia Jimenez, for sharing her expertise. It's been great to, um, to talk with you, Felicia. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, brave of you to put that photo. You know mullets are back now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, trendsetter, that's all I can say. The people like bucket hats too, which I don't have, but I do, I do support those a lot. <laughs> yeah, thanks again for joining, uh, um, joining us today, everybody. Um, you can follow the stories of awkward ursine adolescents every day on the bear cams brought to you by Katmai National Park, the Katmai Conservancy, and explore.org. Until we talk to you again, enjoy the brown bears, and we'll see you soon.